What we've done is we sort of set a framework for discussing this. Now, we've basically done an implementation that is at one end of that framework. Uh, specifically, we looked at doing mobile IP securely uh, in an environment that integrates cleanly into the internet fabric that's already there and into the standards that are already there. And there's some interesting tensions, and so we'll look at, at some of these things. And there's some things that when you, when you go to implement one of these systems that has been standardized without a lot of practice, which is what the IETF does, um, you get a situation where you find out that there are some practical things that got overlooked. And so um, we found a few of those, and we're, we're working on, on some of them. So we'll look a bit at what we've done. Um, so what we did was we combined the mobile IP IPSEC network work that's been done out of the Internet Engineering Task Force with the Waveland Wireless LAN, focusing on issues of security of the information that is transmitted over the network and the survivability of the system. For example, mobile IP as originally proposed has a single point of failure in that there's a notion that there is exactly one home agent associated with a mobile node. If anything happens to that home agent deliberately or accidentally, um, all of the mobile units that depend on that home agent for their connectivity are basically off the air until something else can be done. And so we developed uh, a home agent redundancy protocol that allows us to have multiple home agents serving the same purpose. The home agents use standard uh, reliability protocols to sort of keep a consensus among themselves about who's healthy and who's not and uh, to keep, keep things up and going. So if one of them disappears, uh, it's easy for the others to take over um, the jobs. We've also done work on ad hoc routing um, where mobile units can communicate with one another in the absence of a foreign or home agent. Uh, your laptop and my laptop are out in the middle of a field somewhere. There are no agents in sight. We need to exchange information. Um, there are protocols that, uh, that we've been working on that can do that. An extension of that also says that if I'm in the middle of the field and you're on the edge of the field and somebody else is across the road and they can talk to somebody who is actually connected to a foreign agent, the one of us in the middle of the field can still have connectivity provided everybody else agrees to forward packets. And we have some routing discovery mechanisms and so on that work like that. Okay, we have a project homepage um, at www.cs.pdx.edu slash research slash capital S, capital M, capital N for secure mobile network. And at that point, you can find our code distribution, our technical reports, uh, and a number of other uh, related items. And so if you want to follow up on this, or you want to get this and experiment with it, or whatever, uh, that's the starting point. Um, the portion of the code that deals with cryptography is, of course, export controlled. And that is on a different site at MIT. And the directions for getting that and answering all their questions and so on are dealt with. Uh, from our site. Um, this is work that's been done by a number of people, many of whom are no longer associated with the project for one reason or another. Uh, Jim Binkley and myself uh, are the PIs on this. The basic ideas are Jim's. Jim is the network guru. Uh, me, I do a little bit of security. But Jim is the person who understands the networking stuff. And if my explanation of how these things work is not as clear as it should be, it's because Jim isn't here. <laughs> And he's the person who, who really should be giving more of the second part of the talk. Um, Tom Schubert was with us in the beginning uh, doing some protocol modeling and so on. Um, he's now doing chip verification at Intel. He owns, I think, about 20% of the real estate of one of the next generation chips uh, with the responsibility of making sure that things like the uh, floating point divide problem that they had in the uh, Pentium uh, don't show up again. Uh, he's also making a lot more money than he made at PSU doing that. Uh, on it. Sarah Mokas is our resident cryptographer, uh, currently on the PSU faculty. David Reeder was one of our principal implementers. Uh, he's now at Network Associates TIS uh, in Maryland. Um, Bill Trost was also an uh, implementer. 
And uh, Bill does a good bit of expert witness work on the side, and he was making so much money doing that and having so much fun that he decided he didn't need a regular nine to five job, and uh, so he quit. Uh, we have had at various times about a half a dozen master students, uh, all but one. Well, I guess actually the one has last one has graduated, he's still hanging around teaching some courses at PSU. Uh, I'm trying to persuade him to move on. I gave his name to Peter Neumann the other day, and uh, I know Peter is hiring, so uh, we may persuade him to uh, give up Portland and go down to uh, Menlo Park. Um, okay, our problem space, as I mentioned earlier, is mobile systems as opposed to fixed systems. Wireless or multi-interface. I mean, most of these systems are, are foreign agents and home agents, for example, are multi-interface. They have a wireless interface. They have a wired interface. Um, we can have uh, multiple interfaces on most of the units. Um, most current system design is based on the assumption that the machine is not going to move. That uh, notions of locality of place and so on are built in to the operating system, they're built into the networking, they're built in up, down, and down and sideways into a lot of the applications, uh, and so on. I mean, I don't know of, you know, laptops usually give lip service to mobility by having this little map so you can change the time zone uh, on it. Mine usually does something really wrong when I try to do that, and uh, you know, I tell it I'm in Washington D.C. instead of in Portland, and instead of changing the time to the corresponding Eastern Standard Time. Uh, it adds three hours to the specific standard time and says that's what time it is, uh, but still says PST. Oh well, it's Microsoft product, what can you do um, on it? Um, within the networking, assumptions of locality seem to be built into applications and certainly into the transport network and link layer protocols. Um, these assumptions favor wired systems and they favor fixed systems over mobile systems. Um, if you take a net stack, network stack point of view on this, um, applications layers assume that domain name service of some form exists at the time you bring the system up and that there is a lot of bandwidth for asking DNS type questions. Now as you move around, DNS may be available, but it isn't available from the same place. And it may not give you the same kinds of answers always um, on that. Um, at the transport layer, when a TCP connection disconnects, TCP assumes that's because of congestion on the network. Not that I have somehow gone out of touch and I may be back shortly. What does it do? Well, it throttles back the rate at which it tries to send packets because it says this is a congestion problem. If we all throttle back the rate at which we're trying to send packets, eventually we'll stop dropping so many on the floor and they'll come on through. Well, if the real problem is that I walked behind this metal billboard and no packets are getting through right now, but in 30 seconds when I come out from behind, my full up bandwidth is going to be available again, TCP will have throttled back to the point where it's just barely getting through and it will now take it another minute or so to recover and get back up to using the full bandwidth as it decides that it can send more and more. Um, at the network layer, your IP address implies a physical locality of the subnet on which you're located. That's just the way the networking is set up. Um, on the link layer, wireless metrics for bandwidth and reachability just aren't part of the model. And it may very well be that you know, we have to throttle down the bandwidth when the signal strength drops down because we don't have a good enough signal to noise ratio to get things through. Um, so all of these things are practical problems that we have to try to deal with as we, as we build systems like this. Um, there are some high level problems. Multiple interfaces in networking don't seem to exist very well together. Um, problems of this sort range from the fact that in the, 
Intel architecture world, the idea that one might want to put 17 copies of the same I.O. board into one machine, uh, something that never occurred to the Intel architects. And so usually it's very difficult to get more than one of a particular kind of board. Sometimes if the boards have been carefully designed, you can get two or three. But it's hard to get more than that into one machine because the I.O. structure and the interrupt structure and the addressing structure for memory uh, input and so on just was never set up to deal with that kind of a, that kind of a problem. Uh, another Ethernet card. You've already got an Ethernet card in there. Nobody needs more than one. Um, even people who build firewalls where you really do want to have that physical Ethernet and that physical Ethernet with the machine in between have problems on some implementations of those architectures. Um, so, assumption that you don't change the interfaces or the IP addresses is built into these systems a lot. Take your Windows 95 or Windows NT laptop and try moving it around and see how much reconfiguration you have to do to change from a situation in which you've been given a fixed address at one location to a situation in which you've been given a fixed address at another location to a situation where you're getting an address by DHCP. It'll do all of those. But you have to manually reconfigure the system every time you do one of those things. There's no way to save the thing and say, when I'm at Portland State, my IP address is 192.something.something.something. When I'm visiting at the Naval Postgraduate School, it's 207.something.something.something. I ought to be able to go in and click a single box and have the whole system reconfigure itself so I can plug it in and it's known in different places. And if I'm somewhere else, I ought to be able to click another box that says get the DHCP address. But remember those other configurations. Doesn't happen. Okay. Our individual mobile nodes and even our desktop machines are pretty poorly administered with respect to security these days. And the reason for firewalls is that they like said the typical user of one of these things or the typical administrator of one of these things is completely incapable of operating it in a secure fashion. So now you move it out from behind the firewall and you find it doesn't even have the ability to be administered securely. Uh, so you've got problems on that. Um, another high level problem is finding information on the road that only applies to travelers. You know, and this may be what services are available on the network. Everybody's on the network knows. They're manually configured. You know, you know what printers are there. You know this, that, and the other. Uh, discovering resources that you can use when you're a visitor uh, is just simply not addressed. Okay, mobile IP. Request for comments number 2002. Uh, that was a good car. Um, took a long time to produce. It was on the standards track. It's generally things that these days that go through a standards track like that are obsolete in many ways before they ever get out. Um, the basic goal of mobile IP is to defeat the fixed IP address problems. Um, and the idea is that the mobile node will be given an address and it will be known by that address regardless of where it is. Now that already violates all sorts of nice assumptions because the assumption that an IP address is associated with a subnet which is physically located in some relatively small or logically located in the case of virtual nets in some small area is violated wholesale here. Okay, there are competitors. DHCP um, basically allocates you an IP address of convenience. I call it a lease uh, for some fixed period of time. Um, Network address translation, or NAT, is another way of dealing with this. Um, my home network at home uses that, actually. Uh, all my machines are numbered 200.200.200.200.201.202.203, and so on. Um, when I contact my internet services provider, they translate that into an address of convenience. And the translation actually happens in my router and in their router. And everything works just fine until somebody tries to send an X connection to 200.200.200.201. And it doesn't show up on my screen. So what router are you using in your home? I have an Ascend P75, uh, part of an ISDN connection. So I, have, I wired the house with Cat5 wire uh, two years ago. And uh, I can go into any room at the house and plug into the Ethernet jack and access the printer in the upstairs back closet. Um, on it. Uh, it's good for stiff muscles and uh, scratch fingers and all sorts of things doing that wiring. It's an old house. 
uh, that was a lot of fun. And it's, it's been very, very useful. Um, my wife was doing a lot of work uh, at home for a company. She had a laptop. She'd set it up on the dining table, plug it into the Ethernet jack on the dining room wall. And, uh, you know, much pleasanter place to work than the desk upstairs. Um, okay, uh, there are a number of advantages to mobile IP. Um, one is that it's easy to change links in the same domain. That is, I can move, if I've got this place wired for mobile IP, I can move my laptop all over uh, the domain that I'm wired into. And there's no administrative burden in moving my laptop from a place where the subnet is uh, .201 to the place where the sub subnet is .300 or, or what have you um, on that. Um, we used beaconing by the foreign agents. They send out things saying, here I am, I'm a foreign agent, here's my address, and I'm ready to help you make a connection. The mobile node then can receive all of those, pick the one that looks best, in terms of signal strength, and make a connection through that. You move around, one drops off, another one comes up, uh, you move over, and the transfer is, for all practical purposes, seamless. Uh, even in the middle of a telnet section or an FTP transfer or an inbound connection, uh, you seldom notice any sort of hiccup as renegotiation is done. Uh, works real well. Um, DM, DNS name binding is fixed. Uh, my machine is one of the beer, se beer series, so widmer.cs.pdx.edu uh, uh, retains its same IP address regardless of where in the campus network I move it uh, under the mobile IP. Um, TCP connections may be retained across links. Now, TCP doesn't know the difference. The higher level protocols don't know what's happening here. And so as far as they're concerned, they're always in touch with you. And things that, that really sort of had this notion that you're in a fixed location, everything is fixed, uh, built into them. Anything that has a session mechanism in it uh, works transparently and that's really nice. Other things about mobile IP that we think are good but that people might argue with is that we don't have access points or wireless bridges. Now wireless bridges basically take all the traffic that comes in on the radio side and throw it out on the wired side and vice versa. And so a lot of garbage gets out onto the radio side which is limited in bandwidth and you don't really need it. You really want to do routing so that if you know the signal is on the radio side you send it to the radio side otherwise you leave it on the wired side. And uh, that helps a lot. The other thing is that you can get an extension of the IP address space because you really wind up with an IP address that may have absolutely nothing to do with the subnets that you're talking through on it. And in effect, you can create a 64-bit IP address space and with lots of people running out of subnets because they've got more machines than they ever thought they were going to have, um, that's a pro it's, it's a problem. Doing this you really never go home because your home network doesn't really exist as a first class citizen. You always are running in some artificial network that doesn't can't be addressed on the wired network. Um, there's a meta pro in here that your IP address under those circumstances really acts as a name. In other words, when you're doing that funny kind of thing, normal DNS um, doesn't quite deal with it properly, uh, but the IP address as a name always works um, on it. Um, internal gateway protocols and external gateway protocols across domains have some security problems when you're using mobile IP. Um, and then people say, yeah, but isn't DHCP a lot cooler? You know, I mean, here you've got this idea, you get an IP address whenever you need it and so on. Um, it's slightly different problems. I mean, DHCP doesn't preserve an IP address. And if it's important for somebody to be able to find you by name, DHCP doesn't really support this um, on it. Um, you can make a case that mobile nodes really need to be able to do both. And in fact, we have some DHCP-based implementation of mobile IP, where the mobile node acts as its own foreign agent by getting a DHCP address in the visited domain. 
There are also cases, and, and the security management issue aspects of them are something that we haven't completely come to grips with, but it may very well be the case that I am here working with Brett. I need my IP address on my box in order to be a first class citizen on my home network while I'm here for other purposes. But I also need to access the printer down the hall. And I may need to access that part of the shared file system that I'm allowed to access for the work that we're doing jointly together. And so for that purpose, having an IP address of convenience here that is known here to be local and that allows me certain privileges here is also useful. And there isn't anything about mobile IP that precludes having that second IP address if you can convince the operating system that it's all right for one machine to have two IP addresses simultaneously. In the Unix world, we don't have any trouble with this, but believe me, the Microsoft world does not like this idea um, on it. But then, despite the existence of laptops for quite a few years, they don't like mobility. Yes? Uh, something you might want to add to the Congress is you know, somebody can hack your home domain uh, database, uh, they know where you are. Possibly. And one of the questions that we have is, is this good, bad, or indifferent? And this is a capital P policy question. If you don't want people to know that you are not at home, then determining that you are using mobile IP may uh, cause a problem, or it may not. You can do it in such a way that if they hack the home agent, they can discover that you are away. But remember, the home agent is inside your allegedly protected home domain. And so if your external protections work, then it may not be obvious, except in terms of latencies, that you are not sitting right there, that your packets are in fact coming from halfway around the world. And this is especially the case if we two-way tunnel. We'll talk about triangle routing and some of the things that come along with that in a little bit. Um, mobile IP is sort of a fundamental attack on the IP subnet model. That may be good. That model may have outlived its usefulness in many areas. Um, and this shouldn't be a surprise that mobile IP didn't solve all of the possible mobility problems. Uh, it's not until we try a lot of these things and start using them a lot that we really know what some of those problems are. Okay, uh, just briefly, what the mobile IP protocol does is it lets us discover a link into the foreign domain. This is usually done by beacons that are uh, advertised by the foreign agents. They broadcast it out on the radio interface, says I'm a foreign agent uh, and I have this mobile, I have this service. And it's basically an extension to the uh, internet control message protocol router advertising message with a mobile IP extension on it. Um, forwarding is done by tunnels. That is, an IP inside IP tunnel is built from the home agent to the foreign agent. So addressing is perfectly normal on the outside of that. On the inside of that, it's basically corresponding host to mobile node. Wherever the packet originated that was headed for the mobile node, it retains that as a source address. The mobile node is the destination address. But it's tunneled through this home agent to foreign agent uh, tunnel. That tunneling is stripped off by the foreign agent and the raw packet delivered to the mobile node over the wireless link. And you could do this wired, by the way. We've, uh, I've been trying to get the, uh, the guys to set up a uh, foreign agent on a wired subnet uh, so that all I do is plug into an Ethernet jack and instead of DHCP, I speak mobile IP into the Ethernet. And that'll work. We just haven't, uh, haven't had any uh, real pressure except for me to try that. I want to do that for wiring a classroom. Everybody can bring their laptop into the classroom and we don't have the radio congestion and we don't have the necessity to add uh, $500 radio modems to every laptop. Um, just $300 ethernet cards. Um, but most people will have those anyhow uh, on it. Uh, there's a registration protocol that uses a UDP packet. Uh, you basically send a request to the home agent to register you uh, and that tells the home agent where you are because the foreign agent's IP address gets tacked onto that by the foreign agent. Um, those can be strongly authenticated. Um, this is all done really at the network level, but we have application level daemons that are doing it. So there's a, there's a, uh, a mobile node daemon, there's an agent daemon, 
it all sits there under FreeBSD. Okay, we've done that jargon before. I'll just put that up briefly to remind you of what it says. And we'll look at a couple of mobile IP topologies. The one we've done most of the work with is a foreign agent based mobile IP topology. That is, we have machines that are specifically in the foreign domain to enable mobility that interact with the mobile nodes and set up the endpoints of the tunnels. Uh, but there's an alternative, which is a care of address mobile IP, where the mobile node acts as its own foreign agent. It obtains an address in the foreign domain that it has visited, takes on foreign agent functionality and tunnels from that address, which is a legitimate address inside the visited domain, back to the home agent, and then delivers the decapsulated packets to itself, in effect, um, on that. Um, you could do that with DHCP, you could do that with uh, PPP or any other dynamic IP allocation mechanism, or you could set it up manually. I'm given an address of convenience, I sit down, open up the control panels, type the addresses in, and then use mobile IP uh, with that uh, to talk that. Um, and just remember, we could add a DHCP-like facility on that for local connectivity on top of the mobile IP at any point. Okay, we do this beaconing and discovery mechanism. Um, the agents, home agents and foreign agents, send these router advertisements with the MIP extension out periodically. It's about once a second in our uh, implementation. Uh, I think the mobile IP standards sets upper bounds on the frequency with which those beacons are supposed to occur, because they can chew up bandwidth if you've got lots of people beaconing um, on it. Mobile nodes hear them, look at the signal strength, make a decision who they want to talk to, and send something to that. Now, these are link layer, so they have a MAC address on them, and you pick out which foreign agents you want to talk to in terms of the MAC address. And if their radio receiver is not operating in promiscuous mode, things going to other uh, nodes get filtered out right there. Um, but I say anybody could listen. Um, mobile nodes can also send out a solicitation me message. Is there a foreign agent around here who's willing to carry traffic for me? The beacons are generally more efficient because they let the mobile node see in its environment all the possibilities that it might have. Uh, and to make a decision based on signal strengths, perhaps averaged over some period of time before they start making the connection. Um, the foreign agent beacon provides the foreign agent's uh, care of address uh, and a local link IP address, which may or may not be the same. You know, if we're running, uh, running a virtual network, uh, the local link address may be a private IP address that isn't routable and the care of address may be the only routable thing that can be done. But that gives the mobile node enough to put together the registration packet. It says, I'm here, send stuff in care of this address uh, until I tell you run. Um, this is the sort of thing that happens if we assume we're operating out in the middle of a big field. Uh, our coverage patterns are roughly circular. Uh, inside a building, they're nightmares. Uh, 915 megahertz, 33 centimeters, the wavelength's about like that. Uh, typical spacing of the metal studs in the wall of a building's about like that. Uh, you get interesting reflections and all sorts of good things and dead spots and live spots and, and it's fun. But, uh, you know, the mobile node in this case may be able to hear both of these and make a decision as to which one it's going to work on. Uh, Oh, we don't really need to go through the whole registration sequence. We ought to note that uh, we can authenticate. And as I mentioned, the fact that there is a one-to-one -one relationship between a given mobile node and its home agent means that the administrative details of setting up a public key pair or a pair of private keys for registration or what have you is very straightforward and it scales nicely. It's linear with the number of mobile nodes that we have in the system. Uh, it's not something that grows exponentially or any other nasty thing like that. And it's relatively insignificant compared to assigning the IP address. So it's, uh, it's certainly not a major burden in doing this. Okay, if we have a mobile node operating at home, it talks with the home agent. 
Um, and it's simply a matter of it sends uh, registration or deregistration mechanism message and gets uh, gets an acknowledgement and the packets once it's registered go into the wired infrastructure and away we go. Um, if it's at a foreign agent, things a little bit different. The mobile node uh, sends the message to the foreign agent, which sends the message to the home agent, which acknowledges it. The registration usually has a time period on it; it can be extended and re-registered and things like that. Um, and the foreign agent acts as an application gateway to forward that packet uh, registration. The mobile node says in that packet, here I am, send everything that's destined for me, care of this address until further notice. Um, on that, there are a number of things that can be done. I mean, you can give the mobile node private IP addresses, for example, because those addresses don't actually have to appear. The home agent could be sending traffic uh, through network address translation or something like that to the to the mobile node and uh, so on. Um, okay, once the registration is set up, mobile IP calls for a tunnel between the home agent and the mobile node. The corresponding host, X, is trying to send information to the mobile node, sends the packets with the mobile node's real IP address on them. They go to the home domain of the mobile node. When the mobile node is not at home, the packets are picked up by the home agent, who basically tells the router, send everything for that guy here. The home agent, when the foreign agent is registered, then creates an IP IP tunnel to the foreign agent's care of address. The foreign agent then sends the package onto the mobile node. So the tunnel looks like this. We've got the IP datagram, which is what the corresponding host was really sending. And we've got the header that says, this is coming from X and it's going to the mobile node. We put another header on that that says, this is coming from the home agent going to the care of address. Strip it off and deliver it. Um, everything is fine there. Of course, that's all exposed and uh, we need to add some security to it. Uh, when we move around, the mobile node may decide that the second foreign agent is providing better signal strength or service or what have you. It can deregister and re-register, or it can allow the registration to expire. If the mobile node re-registers through another foreign agent, the registration with the first foreign agent is automatically dropped. And if there are higher level protocols involved and there have been packets sent to the first foreign agent that can't get to the mobile node because it's out of radio range, higher level protocols like TCP IP, TCP will retransmit and nothing will be lost. There'll just be a hiccup in the, uh, in the uh, latency. Um, on that, uh, okay. Rout routing is real fun. Uh, you know, they're, they're, you run out of fingers and toes to uh, keep track of where things are really happening. And if, if anybody really likes to get into the details of routing, let me know. But otherwise, I'm going to go very rapidly uh, through a lot of these because they explain, but they really don't do that much uh, for us. What's much more interesting are some of the authentication issues. Uh, what we do for authentication on this is use a shared uh, MD5 key between the mobile node and the home agent to authenticate the packets. And uh, that's reasonably good. We have replay protection with a timestamp and a randomly generated nonce in the thing. And uh, it works out pretty well. It sets, the it's an extension to the registration packet for the authentication stuff. And so it's over, the, uh, the signature is over the uh, authentication message. And that, that provides adequate protection here. Uh, so between the nonce and the uh, timestamp, uh, you have pretty good protection against replay in most time scales um, on that. It works reasonably well. Um, <laughs> You can have, you know, if you're visiting externally, um, you may very well want to have DHCP requirements so that the mobile nodes can have local address if they need local things. But there are security problems. When you're on the road and moving rapidly, you need foreign agent beaconing 
to do the handoffs quickly because there isn't time to send out a discovery message from the mobile node so is there anybody out there who can handle the traffic and wait for some period of time for the responses and then do the handoff. So we've adopted uh, the uh, agent beaconing um, almost exclusively but mobile IP protocol allows you to do it the other way around. Uh, we can't see any reason why you would want to, uh, to particularly do that. Okay, there are several potential problems here. One of them is that mobile IP is IP level layer. It's a step up, but it certainly doesn't solve all the problems for uh, mobility. Triangle routing, which uh, is what happens as the thing was originally uh, considered, is that the corresponding host would send to the home agent, would send to the foreign agent, which would send to the mobile node, and then the idea was the mobile node would put its own IP address and send it right back to the corresponding host. Well, say, a lot of border routers don't like that. Uh, those packets get dropped on the floor. So in fact, what has to happen is that you have to establish a tunnel from the uh, foreign agent slash mobile node back to the home agent who then detunnels it and sends it back to the corresponding host. Now that will um, go a long way towards hiding the fact that you are um, not at home. Um, but it means that if the corresponding host was in this room, my packets would travel to Portland and back in both directions. So it has a problem of about uh, doubling the routing effort. And uh, that's a problem. Um, Okay, there are operating system flexibility issues, binding the interface IP addresses to the subnets, uh, they're in the wrong place um, by normal parlance, and that's a, that's a problem. Um, the mobile node has to change its default route dynamically, which is a foreign concept to a lot of the routing. Um, the address resolution protocol, which is the way you discover the MAC layer or physical address of a system, breaks down big time in doing this. Um, so we do tunnel out and tunnel in uh, to avoid border router problems and, uh, and the problems of packets showing up in the wrong place with the wrong addresses on them. And the home agent, say, is a single point of failure. Um, security issues, uh, you know, wireless links may be deemed less secure than wired ones, perhaps unacceptably so. And uh, there are also Tempest issues. Uh, most of these machines make pretty good transmitters on their own. And you can often figure out what they're doing just from those signatures, even if we haven't hooked them up to a radio modem. Um, so if we're using wireless within our own enterprise, we still may have those kinds of problems. Uh, outside the enterprise, when we're visiting, the laptop and owner abroad really have left behind any protections that their the enterprise's firewalls might have provided them. And this is not good. Um, the enterprise probably needs to have a separate subnet for visitors that is somehow walled off from the rest of the enterprise just to keep visitors from being able to launch attacks from inside. Um, and the policy must evolve. I mean, lots of institutions simply have just say no as their policy for visitors with, with computers. Um, I'm no longer told most places I can't bring the thing into the building. Uh, that's gotten almost impossible to, uh, to enforce. But, uh, you know, getting connectivity inside the building except by the exchange of disks is, is simply against the rules in a lot of places. Um, key management and authentication are areas that we are looking at. I, the home agent to mobile node authentication and key management is easy. But if I have to authenticate to the foreign agent, before I can make a connection, a request to the home agent, uh, what kind of certificate infrastructure do I have to carry with me? The thing that seems to us to be more reasonable, but a lot of people don't like the idea, is that when I send my 
registration request to the foreign agent. Unless the foreign agent can tell from looking at the address of the home agent that I'm trying to connect to, that this is something that it absolutely will not support based on some domain-based policy. It should send the thing on and possibly request authentication of the home agent and the foreign agent and home agent who are both connected to the wired infrastructure and therefore have access to certificate resources and things like that can perhaps find some mutually trustworthy introducer in the certificate hierarchy that they're satisfied with each other's identities. Once that has been done, it seems not unreasonable for the foreign agent to ask the home agent to serve as a surrogate for authenticating the mobile node, provided the mobile node has authenticated itself to the home agent, to the home agent's satisfaction. That is, the home agent should be the introducer and provide all elements of the certificate hierarchy from whatever certificate the mobile node carries to vouch for its identity up through the hierarchy to whatever was satisfactory for the home agent to authenticate itself with the foreign agent. Uh, asking the mobile node to carry a duplicate set of all of those certificates with it or to have access to those resources before it's made any connections strikes us as being a little bit problematic. And we don't particularly see any risks. If you're willing to trust the home agent, you would trust the mobile node if it presented the same set of materials. And so the only thing beyond the home agent in the hierarchy that the mobile node can present is really its own certificate, which has been, in effect, signed by the same entity that signed the home agent's certificate. And from that point on, you want to have a chain that, that really works. Um, but you need some sort of dynamic lookup for the certificates. There's work in the DNS security area that, uh, that does that. Um, and you probably need some security for all the mobile node packets. Because once the whole thing has been uh, authenticated and so on, it's fairly easy to hijack the connection. And we've seen some ways that we can do that. Um, OK, let's see. Triangle routing, uh, we talked about. And the worst, the worst thing is that it costs you about twice in routing. Um, on other things. Um, let's see. I'm coming up against the time at which I think probably a fair number of you have to leave. So let's look at what the most interesting pieces that are left here. There are a lot of interesting networking uh, issues, but here's a nice security issue. Uh, the address resolution protocol allows a unit to say, hey, I'm IP address such and such and such, and my MAC address has just changed. OK, one way to hijack a connection once the authentication has been done is for a uh, spoofer to come in and say, I'm IP 111.1.1, and my new MAC address is something else. And if that is believed by the foreign agent, all the subsequent packets will go out to a different MAC address. This guy will think he's just faded off the end of the universe. And the connection, the authentication, connect, authenticated connection will be wide open. Now, if we have uh, a secure tunnel with authentication on every packet and or uh, encryption on every packet, this isn't going to help. But if we don't add those features, it's fairly easy to do this kind of hijacking. And given that the strongest radio signal usually wins uh, in a lot of these things, it may be easy for the hijacker to be in the right position as the mobile node fades out to say, whoops, I just changed my MAC address. Here I am, stronger than ever. And until the mobile node re-registers through another foreign agent, those packets will keep on coming um, on it. Uh, promiscuous arc is a, uh, is a bad thing in the mobile environment because it's too easy to do that. Um, OK. Um, if we add IP security and authenticate and or encrypt the payloads of the packets, um, we can protect all of the traffic on the mobile links. And we have the mechanisms in our system uh, for doing this. But when we start talking about 
authentication of agents, we have some scalability problems, and we're we're working with those um, on them. But there's it's an area in which everybody is doing a lot of work, and we don't have any magic answers. We had hoped that we would pick up somebody's key management stuff and just transplant it into our system, and nobody has come along with a suitable uh, suitable candidate for this. Um, There are lots of chicken and egg problems in here because a lot of the proposals that involve securing these connections assume you have a secured connection from which to secure the connection. And when all you've got is this initial radio link which hasn't had anything authenticated on it yet to start with, um, it's hard to get stuff done. To set up security associations, the assumption has been that you have some knowledge on which the association can be based. It can't be that somebody claims that they're Bill Clinton and here's my public key. Oh, you've got to have something better than that. But unless you know the routing is secure, it's too easy to spoof a lot of these things. Unless you have all of the certificate materials and so on that you need on hand. And so our proposal has been basically let the fixed pieces of the infrastructure do this kind of authentication and only worry about authenticating the mobile node to its home agent who has the basis to know who it is um, on that. But uh, a lot of the proposals in DNSSEC and things like that may or may not help, but they sort of assume that everything uh, is, is secure to begin with and this is not uh, in a way. Okay, we've got um, This is one of our, our displays. These are uh, four of our machines, and this is typical sort of thing you see wandering around the building. Uh, Guinness happens to be the machine that is the uh, closest, uh, or has the best signal strength on this particular display of, of the nodes. Prince, Dreadnought, and Defense are uh, other uh, foreign agents. And so this would be the logical agent to connect to. Now, a few minutes later, we might have wandered down the hall and Prince might have come up and Guinness gone down. The system will automatically transfer over, make a new registration, um, packets will be, uh, the home agent will be contacted and new packets will be sent. Um, and uh, everything uh, goes over. Uh, it's basically a heuristic. We go with the best signal strength over a period of, say, 10 seconds to cut out real short-term fades and, and things like that. Um, and once we make a change, we try to stick with it until the signal drops below a threshold where it looks like it's headed on down and we're going to lose it. Uh, we try not to bounce around because bouncing around means re-registration and that's a, a major uh, problem. Um, and we try a foreign agent and if we don't get an act back from we mark that one as bad and go on and, and, and try others. Uh, from a practical standpoint, it has worked really well uh, on it. We've done an ad hoc routing protocol that has mobile nodes acting as routers so that we can get connectivity even when a mobile node can't directly reach a foreign agent or a home agent. And uh, it works pretty well uh, with a limited number of agents. It's not clear if we had lots and lots and lots of choices whether it would pick a fairly optimum one. And an interesting problem to deal with it is uh, can you do things like minimum energy routing? You know, these laptops or mobile nodes have limited power resources. And so it may be that a four hop or five hop uh, connection uses less energy on somebody's transmitter or sends fewer packets through the guy whose batteries are nearly dead or whatever. And uh, we don't know of anybody who's got a good solution to those kinds of problems. Um, Say so we've done a home agency redundancy protocol that has multiple home agents and uh, we have that now up and running and uh, that works out fairly well. It looks sort of like this, that uh, we'd like to have the home agents 
on the same wireless subnet, but possibly on different wired subnets, certainly far enough apart so loss of one power circuit or one piece of Ethernet cable or what have you wouldn't take out the whole thing. Um, and that's uh, experimentally working, working reasonably well. Um, I've also wanted to look at what happens with foreign, agency redund foreign agent redundancy where you send the packets to multiple foreign agents. Uh, when signal to noise ratios drop down to the marginal level in the hope that at least one of them will get through and the higher level protocols will sort out the duplicate deliveries. Uh, we haven't experimented with that, but we can. Um, in the policy area, we need ways that mobile nodes can dynamically take an appropriate policy with them on the road and enforce it with respect to what kinds of connections they're going to permit, uh, what features they're going to provide, what services they're going to provide and so on. Uh, I say there are issues of scalability and keys and policy negotiations. Um, we really would like to look at richer data and connectivity environments for the on the road types. Um, you know, can we support infrared and wireless and wired and so on all out of the same platform so that we can get connectivity in a number of different varieties of, of environments. Um, the issues of loading and throughput in the wireless environment are our problem. And uh, multicast really isn't nicely supported by mobile IP, and that's an area where we think we probably have some work to do. And uh, then in general, ad hoc wire routing in environments that are mixed mobile nodes and fixed nodes, uh, finding a way to get through uh, under various kinds of constraints. Okay, any questions? I'll be glad to answer. Otherwise, uh, thank you very much. And uh, anybody who needs to